so thank you all for being here. Um, we know we're between you all and happy hour, so we're going to try and um, keep our uh, presentation lively to the extent that you can talk about moratoriums and planning policy in a lively manner. Um, I'm Melissa Zornita. I'm the executive director of the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. With me, I have Jay Collins, who is the um, special area studies manager for the Planning Commission, and Johanna Lundgren, who is the assistant county attorney for Hillsborough County. Um, you might notice that two of our panelists, Jared Schneider and Taryn Sabia, are not with us. Um, it's sort of been a running theme throughout these entire projects that we just have to adapt to what happens. And um, both of them have been impacted by COVID in one way or another and could not be here with us today. Jared even recorded his slides for us, but we can't get the video to work. So, I mean, the, the audio recordings to work. So, um, Jay is gonna play the part of Taryn, and I'm gonna play the part of Jared, and we're gonna do the best we can to cover all the topics. And um, thank you all for being adaptable and flexible with us. Um, so, uh, it is a unique situation to have planning moratoriums in Hillsborough County. Um, I've worked in Hillsborough County for over 20 years, and I would say our philosophy until the last couple of years has been very developer friendly. And so the idea of having moratoriums on growth was a pretty about face to how the philosophy had been for years. Um, and so today we're going to share our story of um, what is a bit of a saga um, so we've used the Star Wars theme to share the different chapters in our story. Um, and uh, the first chapter in that is the growth menace. Um, and so the, the area that these moratoriums related to are areas that are outside of our urban service area. Um, the county since the early 90s has had a urban growth boundary, urban service area that set out where we were gonna serve with water and sewer. Um, and uh, initially, these lands were a part of that urban service area. And there was a settlement with the Department of Community Affairs. They said, you have way over allocated how much land you are planning for growth in Hillsborough County. And as part of the settlement to peel back that growth in certain areas, a new land use category was created that was a two-tiered land use category that allowed at its base a rural density of one unit per five acres. And if you did a 160-acre self-sustaining village, you could get up to two units per acre. And maybe in 1990, um, 320 residential units could support some sort of non-residential development, um, some jobs, um, but certainly as time went on, um, that became a big challenge for these areas to develop. In 2005, the Waimama community, which is another rural uh, community historical area in our um, county, um, they did a community plan and decided that they wanted to uh, approach the concept of a village a little differently for their portion of the land use category and focus their non-residential development in their historic downtown, as it were. So, so these are the two areas that we um, were looking at. They, as you can see, are outside the heavy blue line urban service area. The light yellow is the RP2. All the dark blue is the Waimama Village Residential 2. So for years, decades, these areas didn't see any growth. Um, they, they did their job. This land use category worked because it held growth and abeyance, which was exactly what, um, it, you know, to some degree it was intended to do. Um, but Hillsborough County is growing at a, at a 
good pace, and um, we've got a lot of growth coming our direction, over 600,000 more people anticipated by 2045, and a lot of the land within our urban service area has filled up, and so the growth pressure on this area was pretty tremendous. Over time, different uh, landowners and developer applicants initiated, privately initiated text amendments to the comprehensive plan that changed the requirements. So the villages didn't have to be quite as self-sustaining as they were originally. Um, and there were certain uh, provisions in these uh, categories that um, were interpreted in different ways that some landowners agreed with, some did not, some we might be under litigation still for, but um, at the same time, the, the rural residents really started to oppose these projects. They saw that this growth coming outward from the urban service area was having a tremendous impact on their lifestyle. The county doesn't have a lot of resources in terms of making infrastructure improvements, and if they, those resources that they do have were going in the urban service area. So their roads were getting clogged, and it was taking them longer to get to services, to get to their jobs, and there was no real relief in sight. Um, and then lastly, we had a change in composition in the Board of County Commissioners. As I said, for, for the first decade and a half of my career with the, with the Planning Commission, it was a pretty developer-friendly Board of County Commissioners. And um, a couple of years ago, that composition began to change, and they were willing to put some, some, some cur curb some of that development activity to critically look at these issues. And that is what really spurred the idea of the moratorium. So, a moratorium, a new hope. With this, I'm gonna turn it over to Johanna. So, in planning, why would a moratorium be utilized? The first question that comes to mind is what would be the purpose of a moratorium as a tool in planning? And the purpose of a moratorium is really to press a pause button, as you see, on development activities to allow a local government to study and devise new regulations. The intent of a moratorium is to avoid a rush of applicants trying to beat the clock before the enactment of new regulations, which as you all know, can take a significant amount of time. So really, a moratorium is a legal and planning tool, and it ensures that a community's problems are not exacerbated during the lengthy period that's required to create a new regulatory scheme. So the new, the Legal basis for um, moratorium is really the threshold question that may be asked by a court in reviewing the moratorium action by a local government. So local government's authority to enact a moratorium in Florida is based on the concept of uh, local police power, which is the government's authority to enact laws that protect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. And additionally, Florida law grants um, counties police power as well as home rule authority, which is a um, concept that is well-founded in Florida law. So we have the power as local governments to zone and plan based on the local government's police power and home rule authority. Those are well established. Additionally, chapter 163 is there. That's uh, the statutory framework that really underlies our planning. It requires us to plan, requires local governments to enact comprehensive plans and implement them through regulations, land development regulations. So these concepts all together create a legal basis for the use of a moratorium as a planning tool. So 
onto the Constitution of the United States and Florida's Constitution and their relationship to moratoria. So the use of a moratoria implicates the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and Article I, Section 9 of Florida's Constitution with um, the provision that is private property may not be taken for public use without just compensation. Land use regulations and moratoria that are used in conjunction with land use regulations involve the concept of regulatory takings, and that's what the case law addressing moratoria really focuses in on. So the concept of a regulatory taking in the case law that addresses moratoria recognizes that it's possible for a regulation to go so far that it could constitute a taking and require the local government to compensate the property owner financially. So, in addition to the takings clause, a moratorium involves the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment in the Florida Constitution. There are really two components to due process, and one that we'll focus in on a little bit more later on is procedural due process, which is the right to notice in a hearing when government action is going to be taken to affect property rights. And the second component of due process as it applies to planning legislation is the legislative um, land use and zoning decisions that local governments make must satisfy the standards of substantive due process, which um, involves the consideration of a two-step questioning process, which is first, does that regulation seek to advance a legitimate public purpose? And second, is there a rational basis to think that the means of regulation that's used to accomplish the pur purpose is reasonably related to achieving that end? So the courts, when they're looking at a moratorium and the regulations that are being supported by the moratorium, are going to look closely to whether the regulation and the moratorium meet the standards of substantive due process, and they'll also look at procedural due process. So here's the main event when it comes to the court's actions on moratoria, and it's the Supreme Court case, which is Tahoe Sierra Preservation Council versus Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, which was a very landmark U.S. Supreme Court case that addressed the question of whether a 32-month moratorium went too far in creating a regulatory taking when the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency needed to address regulations regarding the lake. They needed some time to do that, and 32 months ended up being the length of that moratorium. So the Supreme Court considered the question and answered with a 6-3 majority that the regulation was a temporary regulation in nature, and this moratorium uh, was analyzed under the Penn Central takings test, which really um, required there to be a consideration of the rational basis of that moratorium, and the court ultimately looked at the fact that this time period that the Regional Planning Council was taking was necess necessary to accomplish the planning goals. So the 32-month moratoria th that was applied in Lake Tahoe, the decision really was important in that it justified the use of a moratorium in many cases um, in local government actions. So you may wonder, 
you know, when is a moratorium really warranted? Obviously, enacting a moratorium is going to draw a lot of attention to the local government. It's going to rouse the concerns of uh, applicants within the community and probably or potentially draw a challenge. So there is really a use in a time and place for a moratorium, and that's when there is um, need for time to study and develop new or amended regulations. It takes time, as most of you uh, public planners out there recognize. And additionally, there's a lot of need for community engagement. Chapter 163 uh, really encourages us to engage the public as much as possible in the planning process. Another um, example of when moratoria come into play is when there is a novel regulatory issue. Uh, medical marijuana back in 2016 was a big one. We had the constitutional amendment. That constitutional amendment enacted this uh, very unique and novel um, situation put into play of uh, medical marijuana dispensing, and we had to wait as local governments on the action of the state to give us guidance. So many local governments, uh, possibly some that you guys work for, uh, did undertake moratoria to put a pause on medical marijuana dispensing activities while the local government could figure out their regulatory plan. So I'm gonna go through a couple of very um, significant Florida DCA cases, Florida District Court of Appeals that is, um, which addressed moratoria in the context of um, planning and zoning. One was uh, Leon County versus uh, Glusenkamp, which involved uh, stormwater regulations in Leon County, where the county was uh, up against uh, action uh, by, I guess, DCA at the time and was um, subject to an injunction against development in a certain portion of the county. The county had to react to that by adopting an interim development ordinance or a moratorium that limited development of certain properties. So after the circuit court issued a ruling for landowners that challenged the moratorium, the Court of Appeals considered whether that moratorium created a compensable taking and looked to the Lake Tahoe case to determine the economic impact on the property owner who challenged the moratorium, asking whether that moratorium really interfered with the property owner's distinct investment-backed expectations. And the court stated that there was a very little evidence, if any, supporting a reduction of the challenger's property values and the owner's expectations should have been balanced by the fact that there was widespread awareness that the county was uh, faced with this, um, this challenge by uh, DCA of its comprehensive plan and was having to regulate and take on um, some time to change its regulations. So that um, decision upheld that moratorium. WCI Communities versus City of Coral Springs was another significant um, District Court of Appeal case that came after the Tahoe Sierra Supreme Court case. And this involved an effort by the city of Coral Springs to address some rapid development of multifamily units in the mid to late 1990s. The city imposed a nine month long moratorium on uh, processing of site plan applications for townhouse and multifamily development as it prepared regulatory changes in its um, land development regulations. So the circuit court found that the city's temporary moratorium did not deprive uh, WCI, which was a developer, of its uh, substantive due process rights or create a temporary taking of WCI's multifamily zone properties. The court applied a rational basis test to find that the moratorium did not deprive WCI of substantial due process rights. The city was found to have a very legitimate uh, well-founded public purpose for its proposed changes to the development regulations and the use of the moratorium bore a rational relationship to this objective. 
the court had signed to the Tahoe Sierra United States Supreme Court decision for its holding that a moratorium is a valid regulation that serves to protect the status quo while the local government formulates its changes to its regulations. So we've established that a moratorium is a lawful tool for land use planning. But how does a local government lawfully go about enacting a moratorium? So there is a case on point that tells you kind of what not to do, which is to uh, you know, follow the process that applies to zoning changes to private property. Uh, local government can't just simply adopt a normal ordinance. You have to go through the process of um, in that case, it was um, a municipality, so it was the municipal um, process for adoption of a rezoning um, county. For a county, it would probably be considered to be through the same process, um, requiring the necessary public hearings, requiring the necessary notice. And that um, case really illustrates the importance of if your local government is looking to enact a moratorium, consult with your local government's attorney, whether that be uh, your city attorney, your county attorney, or other uh, council, to make sure that you're, one, going through the right process, and two, that you're gonna have the time that you need to advertise and hold the requisite public hearings. So plan in advance if this is a potential consideration for you. So to wrap up, before I hand the microphone back to one of my colleagues, I'll give a quick overview of how we ended up in the process for adoption of our moratoria in Hillsborough County. So we'll see, uh, back in, it seems like forever ago, <laughs> in 2019, in the fall of 2019, the Board of County Commissioners directed us to study and prepare amendments to the Conference of Plan and Land Development Code and the two planning areas that uh, Ms. Ordina introduced, the RP2 Residential Plan 2 and Waimama Village Residential WVR2. And at that time, the board recognized that we need a way to protect the status quo to keep applications from you know, beating on the doors and coming in in a way that may not be consistent with what is ultimately adopted. So moratoria were directed on rezonings and zoning modifications within specified areas of the residential plan two area and within all of the WVR2 area. So two advertised public hearings were held for each moratorium ordinance. They ended up lined up on the same um, date of adoption and the initial adopted length of the moratoria was set at 270 days. That took effect on December 4th, 2019. And that um, begins our, <laughs> our saga of, <laughs> of our process that began with the moratorium. So the next chapter in our story is the community awakens. Um, and uh, we began in earnest after um, the moratorium were enacted to begin having community meetings. And um, so uh, again, there was quite a bit of um, news uh, press about these areas and the projects. There were a lot of zonings that precipitated the moratorium, um, four or five in a row that um, were getting either denied or um, sent back for more work because they, um, there was so much um, community opposition to the projects. And so, so as Johanna described, um, we took a pause. Um, again, the, the first area that I'll be describing is the RP2 area. This is where it is geographically in relationship to downtown Tampa. Um, and, oh, I'm 
I'm not sure. Okay, we're going to skip. And, and as you can see, the um, development pattern in what is the urban service area can be easily recognized on the aerial. Suburban development pattern off of I-75, and then it quickly transitions to a very rural agricultural area. And that was uh, the crux of the issues that we heard from the community. The area also is composed of quite a bit of environmentally sensitive lands. Um, so you can see in the light green, the areas that are identified as significant wildlife habitat, and then in the darker green, areas that are um, acquired through our environmental lands program. And the area outlined in red is sort of the heart of where this was focused, and it's pretty much surrounded by these environmental areas. So um, not only were there the issues of you know, change in lifestyle, but there's concerns about uh, the impact on the environmental areas as well. So as I described earlier, we're, we have a lot of growth coming to Hillsborough County and the city of Tampa. And a lot of the discussion in our community is about where that will go. And for years, we have projected that some of that population would go into the RP2 and the Waimama areas because they had the land use categories that could accommodate it. Um, but not everybody agreed with that idea. Um, so we, had a num we heard a number of community concerns, um, certainly from the agricultural community we heard a lot about protecting their property rights. They have had an expectation that they would be able to potentially build two units per acre. They've leveraged that entitlement to get loans for agricultural production and things of that nature. So, so they had a, a, a lot of concerns and were a major stakeholder in our efforts. Um, and then the residents, though there were not a lot of folks who live in Balm, Florida, um, those who live there were very concerned about maintaining the rural character. They had a particular aversion to the concept of clustering, which is something that to me, I had a hard time wrapping my head around um, because as a planner, we want clustering, right? We want to protect all that open space. They saw the clustering as forcing smaller lot sizes than they were comfortable having in their community. In particular, they were seeing a lot of proposals with 40 foot wide lots. They did not care for that. Um, uh, there were provisions in the original RP2 for buffering and screening that were not always complied with with some of the projects, so they had a lot of concerns about just the visual impact, the change in how the community looked. Um, as I mentioned previously, the lack of improved infrastructure was a concern pretty much from all of the stakeholders, the development community um, included. And then because this category had this idea that every 160 acres or more would be a self-sustaining community, there were requirements for on-site commercial. Um, and that was not necessarily realistic um, in all of these projects. And so there was a lot of concern from the development community about um, creating raised expectations in the community that something would happen, infeasible projects, um, things of that nature. So we heard from the community um, a lot of the same types of things that I've just described. This was one of the tools that we used to show them what they, they had been sharing with us at some of the community meetings. And I think really this slide articulates it really well because we it was a real balancing act to try to figure out how to approach this. Um, you know, there, folks didn't want the growth, but they wanted better infrastructure. Well, the main way to pay for better infrastructure is through paying mobility fees. You don't get mobility fees if there's not development. So there's just sort of this catch-22 inherent there that, um, that they sort of needed some of the growth to bring some of the infrastructure and improvements to, to bring the new school site, um, things of that nature. Um, they wanted to uh, maintain the rural character. Oh, shoot, why is it jumping ahead? Um, and, uh, but also were 
concerned about the clustering, which again, we had thought the clustering was a tool to help with the rural character because it would allow for more open space, but they were, were not crazy about that. Um, they wanted larger lot size. They were not as interested in preserving greater open space. Um, they uh, were, were wanted to see um, some benefit to their community from these developments if they were going to occur, but certainly the cost of how a developer was going to create that benefit was something we heard from a lot of the landowners. Why does it keep doing that? Um, adapting to all the issues, that's for sure the theme of this. <laughs> Um, uh, and then there are a larger property owners and then there are smaller property owners within this. And so we had to balance, um, you know, that there had always been this 160 acre threshold, which is a quarter of a section. That's how it was derived. Um, and uh, and that, that was in there, and, but yet there are a lot of property owners that were smaller than that. So the infrastructure concerns you've described, this is an example of Balm Road and just kind of gives you an idea of, it's really rural infrastructure out in this area. Um, these were, this was one of the, the projects that was developed in that area and you can see it doesn't look like a rural area, it's a suburban subdivision. Um, and so the, the clustering was definitely a, a big issue. They would have liked to have, the community would have liked to have seen larger lots like are shown on the right here. Um, of course, the development community wanted the smaller lights, lots on the left side. So that issue, I think, has been one of the biggest ones that has per, been pervasive throughout this project was what is the right style and development pattern for this area. Um, this was an example of a, a graphic that we showed them, again, trying from the planner perspective to, to show them what clustering could do, right? And they did not buy it at all. Um, so it really was interesting and something that, that, like I said, that I had to kind of wrap my head around, like, okay, we're going to undo all the clustering requirements. This is, seems counterintuitive. Um, and then the buffering and screening, as you can see in the project um, pictured here, they had a very large buffer area, but you still could see the suburban subdivision. So the community really wanted their rural, the rural feel to be maintained, that um, those scenic uh, kind of vistas um, preserved. And so that became a major issue as we moved through the project. With that, I'm going to ask Jay to come talk a little bit about the major issues in Waimama. Thank you. So one of the things with Waimama that's different from what we were doing in Balm is that Waimama is actually an update of a community plan. Uh, community planning in Hillsborough County is a secondary planning process. We have what's called a livable communities element within our comprehensive plan that houses all of the community plans. This, Why Mama, is the first one that has been updated. So we have about 20, 22 of them in the county that have been adopted, and you'll find those in the livable communities element, goals, objectives, and policies related to the community plan, whereas the larger community plan, could be a couple hundred pages, is a separate document that's non-adopted. All you would adopt are those goals, objectives, and policies. So what we're doing here in Why Mama is fulfilling part of the promise from 2007. Part of that promise back in 2007 is that creation of the WVR2 pro, uh, land use, which is Waimama Village Residential 2, from the areas just to the north, Baum, Residential Plan 2, but there's no zoning for it. They ended up with a zoning up in Baum. Residential Plan 2 has a zoning. Waimama didn't, so that's number one. So you, you need to have a zoning for it. They didn't create a zoning. Number two, this area is partially in the urban service boundary. Waimama is a historic agricultural community pre-World War II. It's been there for quite a while. It's in a rural area, certainly rural, until the last 20 years or so of Hillsborough County. Um, you can see here on this map, if you guys are familiar with Hillsborough County or even Southwest Florida, US 301 is running north and south, and we've got I-75 running north and south. But a lot of the urban service boundary, once you go across that line, you're done. It's, it's like a lot of areas that you go through 
uh, Florida. You, you, it just appears, you know, State Road 60, um, US 92, 27. It's all when you go through one of the cities that you see something, and then it goes right back into agricultural land. So we have a couple of things that we're updating in this. So we just talked a little bit about the comprehensive plan, the livable communities element, future land use element. We do have an actual land use we're talking about here with the WVR2. And then we have that zoning, the zoning being for that land use WVR2, and also a downtown overlay, why mama do, the downtown overlay. And we'll have a couple of little conversations about that, but again, that is a historic area of downtown why mama, but it's not historic that you would think of when you go through a small town in Florida with a pre-World War II downtown, most of that is gone. But it is a place where people live, people get their services, people have their businesses, people have their churches there. And so that's part of that conversation that we have with everybody is to update that, have that conversation with people and see where they see themselves moving forward in that community. There's also an urban design plan and a strategic action plan. These are part of the non-adopted uh, documents that you have with it. That strategic action plan is very important for the community of Waimama, for the stakeholders that we worked with, the boosters in Waimama, the non-governmental associations, the nonprofits that are in Waimama, the churches that are in Waimama, everybody who works to uplift Waimama, that strategic action plan is something that's important to them. What it does is it prioritizes some of their issues that they have and then provides some actionable items that they may be able to either take on to themselves through going after grants or other types of issues or by going in front of their appointed and elected officials. So what are some of our overarching issues that we had in Waimama? Again, updating the entire community plan. Health, housing, and opportunity. Um, Health may partly be because of, of what we have with COVID, but it's also because this is an area that we talk about food deserts. There's also health deserts. There's also areas where in this area particularly, you're underinsured, not insured, and who actually comes out there and works with a lot of the folks that are out there? Catholic Charities, bringing buses out there to actually provide cancer screenings and other issues that we have out there. Why Mama also, um, today, most certainly, is uh, English speakers of other languages where they're not speaking much English at all. And for somebody who does not speak Spanish, that's um, an eye-opening situation, right? Because what you do when you go out there and you work with somebody, you very quickly learn that your skill set, um, you left it a long time ago when you actually have to work with folks who you cannot verbally communicate with them unless you've got one of our other staff members, Sofia Garantiva, out there who can help with Spanish, who can translate things for us. Um, and you learn very quickly, as Sofia and I had those conversations, Spanish doesn't translate very well into comprehensive plan, into zoning. <laughs> and especially, right, Gil, when you're having conversations with folks about what it means for those types of issues, it, it, you know what? when you guys work with your community, sometimes it flies over their head, right? If they don't know the language to begin with that we speak in English to learn how to do this in the first place, it flies over their head real quick. So that boots on the ground approach to public engagement is really what you have to do. You have to go out to the community, you have to have those conversations with them. And we'll talk a little bit about how COVID had us trying to have our boots still on the ground. So some of those key input from the community that we ended up with is walkability, transit. Again, this is an area that's underserved, doesn't really have much transit. All of South County doesn't have much transit. Um, bicycle network and trade, a walking school bus. These are all things that they looked at with safety in their community, mobility in their community, and opportunity in their community. So a little bit more input about maintaining that diversity within the Waimama community which again, for some of you who may know Spanish, what's why mama, por qué mama? It really, right off the bat, was really interesting when we would actually use the um, tech, what we had in tech. So PowerPoint right now, you can go ahead and put a plug in right now into PowerPoint and you can go ahead and have it translate as I'm speaking to you into Spanish. 
So, of course, every time we would say, why mama, it would go, por que mama? <laughs> and, and right off the bat, I have to tell you, you're trying, but the community is looking at you with just, just scratching their head, just having that conversation of like, is this real? Is this what we have? So it's, it's very difficult, and again, it opens you up real quick. Um, create opportunities, uh, excuse me, uh, for enhancing the wellness through the public realm, safer streets. We talk a whole lot about that public realm, what you're looking for in your sidewalks, what you're looking for for connections, trails, bicycle networks. Um, State Road 674 cuts right through the heart of Waimama, so that's another thing working with District 7 for DOT in this area. And I believe for the attack of the pandemic, this may go straight into, yep. So what we started with, we started this with what you would do with anything. You start off with charrettes, you start off with open houses. Uh, the community planning process is an adopted process in Hillsborough County. We sent out several thousand mailed notices. We have huge signs that go out into a neighborhood. Um, the online presence at that time is you know, your website. You know, it's, it's, it's a website that you've got for your agency telling folks, hey, we're gonna have a community meeting. Um, all the material for that community meeting will be available online. You can show up to the meeting, you'll get it there. Uh, we'll go ahead and put some notes online for you afterwards. It's that tried and true what we've done for years, you know? So it was pretty interesting that the next time, literally we did this in March of 2020. So from having those community meetings, which we did get to have those community meetings, the very next week, we were in three hour Zoom meetings back with our stakeholders. It, it, was, it was, again, mind boggling to be able to have that transition happen. And sometimes it was smooth. Other times there were bumps in the road. Um, a lot of it also right off the bat, you guys can stare at this. That's not really what it's there for. What it's there for is again, that idea of what are we about to do? I went out to a community. The community came to me. We had a, almost 100 people who showed up in Waimama for a community that's only a couple thousand people. That's a pretty good turnout. Well, all of a sudden, I'm in an area, rural, not a lot of internet out there, not a lot of English proficiency, not a lot of ability to actually stop and have a conversation with somebody when you're in a Zoom meeting. So we, right off the bat, we started asking these questions, you know, okay, well, we can do telephone town halls, we can do um, uh, parking lot drive-ins, you know, well, they don't have cars, a lot of people out here. Um, we can go ahead, we looked at these things um, all the way on the left of the screen, um, whether it was MetroQuest and some of the others, wonderful tools. They've got a lot of great things that, for plug-in, but I'm already in a project. I have a budget and a line item for public engagement. Some of you probably did the same thing. It didn't work. You were gonna have to move a lot in there or you were gonna have to go back to the well and get more money to do some of those things. So what did we end up doing? We ended up learning as we went. So one of the things that we did real quick is we wanted to boost our online presence. We basically littered these communities at times with signs because it was one way in which we could still get out there in COVID when the state of emergency happened, we weren't allowed to go back out there and have those conversations with folks anymore. We also started having Zoom meetings. We ended up with stakeholders where we would be either having weekly, by, uh, uh, every other week or monthly. We ended up having surveys. We tried all of the bells and whistles to some degrees of success. Once it went back last summer, July, August, there was a push for us to go back out into the community. This wasn't even a push that we got from our elected officials and appointed officials, which comes later. This is the community wanting access to us. So um, whether it was a great idea at that time or not, considering where COVID was, we went back out into the community and started doing hybrid meetings. And so that's one of them that we had. And, and again, trying to find places in the middle of a pandemic that can get you access. So that's not us. We didn't get access into that community college. That's our community stakeholders that did that. So that's them putting in that work, which is very tried and true of the success of some of these projects is only the success of the people that live there and their input and their want for this to actually be successful. 
This is what we do professionally. Of course we want it to be successful. But when you actually have members of the community who will go to bat for you, that's what really speaks volumes of us as a profession and what we're trying to do. So a little bit of it, again, you know, videos online. Now all of the Zoom recordings, everything, all of our Zooms are recorded and they're back online. Um, having those meetings back out in the community that we went through. And, you know, again, um, in the end, we think that it came off and looked okay. But I'm sure you guys were in that same boat where you looked at it and you said, the public doesn't see all that back-end chatter of how are we actually going to make this successful? How are we going to manage expectations? So this was us. I mean, this was us trying to figure out what we were going to do with a lot of this. Finally, just where we were last year before we head on to the next. Um, we had those open houses in the beginning of March, you know, and we went into that uh, pandemic right there around like St. Patrick's Day, right? It's a St. Patrick's Day none of us will ever uh, forget because it didn't happen. You know, everybody had a plan, everybody was going to do something, and then it got canceled. It's like canceling Christmas, just canceled St. Patrick's Day. So um, the community surveys that we talked about, the uh, visual work, uh, virtual work sessions, which then would have like visual preference where we were trying to get uh, that idea of what, what works best here, um, using uh, Zoom's interactive polling, um, whiteboards, you know, all, all the bells and whistles. But again, you go from 100 people down into the teens real quick because it's just that online presence the community I'm working with, and also the way in which some people want to actually communicate with you and want to work with you. Um, we did go back out in November and we had virtual and then in-person um, um, uh, open houses where again, we mailed thousands of notices to people and had some success in separating people out to where they could actually go in one room of Waimama Elementary School to actually see a taped recording of the virtual presentation. And then we were in the cafeteria, staff and the consultants, to then go through questions and show boards, old school open house ideas. Again, um, this is just working with community members, getting the principal to let us into Waimama Elementary, masking up, bringing hand sanitizer, and going through it. So I think that's it for this portion. And so now I think we're going back over to our law, to Johanna with the extension strikes back. <laughs> so in the spring of 2020, you know, the world basically flipped upside down for pretty much everyone, and it became evident with the pandemic that our original timeline to complete the process of adopting our comprehensive plan amendments and code changes uh, related to this planning process, that that wasn't going to be workable, that we needed additional time because the pandemic has really thrown a wrench in our process, in our public engagement, in our stakeholder participation. And um, as you've heard from um, Melissa and Jay, we're you know, really involved and we're underway. And then this situation comes about and we have uh, basically a huge upset. So what is the process that would govern an extension of a moratorium? That was the question that was posed to me. And you know, this was the first time I had had an issue where a moratorium that I had worked on had to be extended. This was uh, new to me, but it's not a question that you know, is unanswered by the case law. While there isn't really a case law case decision that I can think of about an extension per se, the case law does address the length of a moratorium and the permissibility of um, a moratorium of excess of a year. So as we, we um, talked about earlier, that Lake Tahoe U.S. Supreme Court decision um, dealt with a 32-month moratorium, and that case, 
know, the U.S. Supreme Court in that case really uh, reflected on the length of a moratorium, saying that anything that exceeds a year could face special scrutiny. But as a whole, the case law out there is really on the point of moratorium really can only be as long as it is needed to be to allow the local government to complete its planning process and finish its um, objective. So in June 2020, the spring of uh, 2020, when the pandemic was, you know, kind of a new uh, situation, we were directed, um, county attorney's office was directed by the board to um, provide for an extension of the original moratorium. So both um, the residential plan two and WVR2 moratoria, the original ordinances that I had prepared did recognize the ability to approve an extension with a single public hearing. So we proceeded through that process. And of course, in the ordinance, there was a lot of background and a lot of documentation about the need to justify or about the justification rather for the extension of the moratorium to address the needs of additional stakeholder participation and work based on the pandemic. And on June 17th, 2020, the Board of County Commissioners adopted the ordinances providing for the extensions of the two um, moratoria for these areas for 270 days beginning September 1st, 2020. And that resulted in an initial revised initial end date for ex the extensions. The extended moratoria were extended, or the moratoria, excuse me, were extended to May 29th, 2021. So you'll um, hear more about the, of the way that the process and the participation and ultimately um, the board hearing on February 4th proceeded, but this um, basically explains our final extension to the moratorium, or moratoria rather, that uh, is now currently in effect and was directed during the February 4th, 2021 public hearing. Um, the BOCC directed the county attorney's office to prepare and advertise ordinances providing for the moratoria to be extended to December 31st of this year in order to allow sufficient time for staff and consultants to engage stakeholders and complete the process. So that was the second extension. And you know, being that we were in still a very tenuous situation with COVID-19 and the board had concerns about the process enabling all the stakeholder participation and the time of analysis and length of, um, of stakeholder um, engagement. That was the direction of the board and that was the ultimate extension that is now in effect that has um, yielded the ability to continue the project for both the WVR2 and the RP2 areas. And I'll turn it back over to either Jay or Melissa to explain where we um, kind of ended up in dealing with the rest of the project. Right. So we have we, we now have the rise of the resolution. And I think, Jay, you get to talk about the outreach I next. <laughs> so yeah, so as Johanna was mentioning, after the board directed staff to go back out and work with uh, the community, after the community called for us to come back out, obviously one of the first things we did this time 
not that we didn't do it the first time, but is we said, okay, well, we have to do this under the Hillsborough County's procedures for what they're doing, you know, about making sure that uh, everybody who shows up has a face mask on, everybody doing your social distancing. Um, Hillsborough County themselves were there, the Parks and Recreation, the Sheriff's Department, because we were doing temperature screenings when you come in. You have only so many people that you allow in during the session at one time. So we were in reasonable size community centers that on a normal day would allow you the opportunity to have 50, 60, 70 people in there. But because of COVID, that went down to 20. But it's also got some staff in it, so 16? So what that actually would end up meaning is I would have to run multiple sessions. And so uh, for Waimama specifically, we'd be out there on Saturday mornings, pretty much all of spring. So, and we would be there once, sometimes twice in a month on a Saturday morning. First session would be at 10 a.m. Last session would be at 1 p.m. We end up having one of those sessions fully in Spanish. And then we ended up having activities outside so that I've got uh, areas that you can go ahead and again, do visual preference with stickers. Um, planners would be out there, just sit down and chit chat with you and take down notes if you have questions about some of the work that's coming out. Uh, basically just trying to get ourselves back in, but also with that expectation of how we can do this safely. Uh, we also of course did this with a Zoom platform, so it was hybrid. Those Zooms at that time were being run by the community, which was great again to have that access to community members. Um, what you see here is the Why Mama Now organization. It's a, basically a nonprofit community organization made up of a variety of some of the other organizations that are out there. And their purpose was, and still is, for the upliftment of Why Mama, the redevelopment of Why Mama. Um, we always think it's funny. You see the bricks that you see down there in the bottom left? Well, at first we had like bits of two by fours. The wind out there is those two by fours, the boards just went, they're flying around. So the next time we ended up with bricks out there. It's amazing sometimes what you have to make do with to get the job done because you can't put boards up there on easels when the wind is going at you know, 12 to 15 miles an hour the whole time because you're in a rural community and there's nothing that breaks down the wind. So, you know, again, like I said, we had these meetings. That first meeting, that open house meeting, again in the community, now the third time that we sent out several thousand notices in um, one year. So as we ended up notifying everybody in one year, and we still did that one more time as well. Then these topic meetings that we went through, and for Waimama and also for Baum, what we were doing is we were being reactive to the conversations that we had in front of the board and also managing the expectations of being able to extend an offer to the folks to say, let's go ahead and have a conversation about this proposed work. Because that was one of the big things. People just didn't get what we were doing sometime. They would get, oh, it's community plan update, but why are, why are we doing all this with the zoning and the two homes and why are you raising the density? No, 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 we're not raising the density. It's always been one unit to five. It's always been two if you meet these. But, but you just said that it's one to five and you're raising it to two. No, 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 that's not what we're doing. So, you know, you, it was that constantly. Also, with both of these, because you are out there so often, you're meeting new people almost every time you go out. And that takes a lot out of your staff because you get to have that conversation. You get your Groundhog Day, you get to Bill Murray it, and you get to have that same conversation again, but for that person that you're having the conversation with, it's their first time. So we did that a lot, and I think that we did a good job on bringing people into the fold, and at times, it was the volunteers who were helping have those conversations. So once those volunteers, those stakeholders got it and they understood what was happening in their community, they also could help us with some of those conversations. So again, here you can just see some of the photos of us out in the community, the social distancing, the masked up, uh, as well as when you would come into, and this is BOM, when you would come into the community center, you would go through a checkpoint and have your temperature screened and everything else. And, and, you know, this part of the public engagement, just kind of end with this, like, this is normal. It was. 
We had kids who came out. We worked with kids. We did, you know, projects with them so that they had something to do while mom and dad were doing something. Um, why mama would bring out food trucks. So we would end up, you know, having tacos during, before, after, whatnot. And you're smiling. You're having a good time. There are smiles behind those masks. Even though there was a lot of stuff that was going on in all of our lives at that time, it was still enjoyable to be out there and working with them, to make those acquaintances, make some friends out of the folks that you've been working with for so long. And again, they put in a lot of work to get to where they are today. So this goes back to... No, I'm Jared again. You are Jared now, okay. yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So... Um, talking about how the resolution was arrived at, specifically in the Balm community for the RP2, um, similar to what Jay described, there were a lot of focused meetings on the topics um, that we identified were continued kind of bones of contention and that needed to be worked out. Um, they uh, did a beta test. I'll show you some examples of that to kind of test out what the regulations would result in. Um, there was a market analysis that was done. Early on, we utilized that as a tool to better understand sort of this dynamic of self-sustaining community and what, um, what really can be expected. Um, how many dwelling units do we need to have to really generate a downtown in Waimama or a self-sustaining village in Balm? Um, and there was a lot of coordination with multiple departments. Um, I would say if there's one big, uh, Johanna said it earlier, but if there's one big takeaway throughout this process, having a good relationship with the county attorney's office has been critical. Um, so, I mean, I, we couldn't have done it without you guys and um, because there not only were issues with the moratorium, but there were issues with, okay, how, how do we write this policy language that doesn't run afoul of state statute? The community wants the infrastructure to be concurrent with the development. Concurrency, not so much a thing that's allowed anymore. So how, how, do we, how can we get at that concept in a different way? Um, and then we had workshops with the board and the planning commission, you know, trying to, to understand where their concerns were as well. So we utilized tools like this that identified where there were points of agreement, what needed work, some of the headings are, you know, this is what the Balm Community Association was saying, this is what the development community was saying, this is what some of the other landowners are saying, okay, what, where, where are their common agreement and, um, and it developed into things like a PowerPoint slide like this, where we, we identified the concerns, we identified where we started to build some agreement, and then where were the places where we still needed to work. Um, so there, there was, we, we were able to find agreement on some of the aspects related to design and community character, things like utilizing dark skies uh, types of regulations that would help um, these more suburban style developments blend in and not have the visual impact on the community. Um, the development community was very ready to support more predictable buffer and screening so that we could, um, uh, again, mitigate the impact visually. Um, but the issues of lot sizes and development pattern um, were, were kind of pervasive throughout this. Um, what we were gonna do with, in particular, the lots around the perimeter from a visual standpoint. And then this concept came, as I mentioned earlier, about community benefits. Um, of, okay, if, if a developer wants to do two units per acre and they're no longer gonna be required to have on-site commercial because we recognize that, that the commercial needs to be broader for a larger community than their 160 acres, what else are they gonna be able to do and provide to the community? Can they provide some park space, some recreation areas? Can they provide the school site? Are they able to make a trail connection, some other multimodal connection? And identifying what those community priorities were and then what was feasible from the development standpoint were a big part of the discussion. So these are some examples of the beta tests that were done and we found this to be a very effective tool, particularly with dealing with folks who don't, they don't understand a zoning code. 
Um, but they could understand visually the comparison of these two. So this was what the existing code on the, on the left, what we proposed in February on the right, and that folks were still not real happy with. And so again, the, the, the extension to the moratorium, again, gave us more time to work through that. And then this was a, a beta test of what we came up with in July. And all of the aspects of this resolution um, have been transmitted to the state as plan amendments, but knock on wood, in October we'll, we'll really get resolution and it'll be adopted. Um, so, um, so again, visually having the community be able to understand where are the different lot sizes is gonna be allowed to occur, what is from the exterior, what we're gonna see of these projects was really important. Um, some of the design requirements looking at, instead of having commercial within their development, could they have civic space, daycares, things of that nature that might be more realistic in a project that might have 500 units within it? Um, looking at the mix of lot sizes and making sure there was variety. Um, a limit, ultimately, we eliminated the 40-foot wide lots. Um, Buffering, screening, open space, community benefits, I've covered that. So this is some of the, the lot sizes that are in the current proposal, the smallest one being a 50 foot wide lot. Not sure the development community is super thrilled about that, but it was what works in the community. Um, and, and ultimately what the Board of County Commissioners supported was having really a mix of these and ensuring that there was some component that was larger because of this rural community. Um, having a more predictable sliding scale of buffering and screening. So as the buffer narrows, the amount of screening uh, material has to increase. And then, um, what is Jared trying to say here? <laughs> so again, this is an example of how it could also lay out looking at how the different lot sizes and taking into account that there's going to be land set aside for stormwater, for streets and right away, trying to be make sure that these are feasible from a development perspective as well, not just what the community wants, but also um, can, can they work from a development perspective. And then these are some of the community benefits. They're hard to read here, but um, the community prioritized some of the tools to incentivize developers to provide infrastructure. Um, there's a structure as part of our mobility fees where a developer can go ahead and accelerate basically building a improvement um, as sort of an, an offset if it's on the uh, county CIP list. Um, and they might be able to build it um, more affordably than the county could. Um, enhanced buffering and screening, a greater percentage of larger lots than is already required. Having more housing types, so in, enhancing that variety. Giving land to a community use, um, such as a school or uh, other uh, library, fire station. There's a lot of infrastructure that's needed out here, so there's a lot of opportunity for developers to help play a part in that. Um, and then also knowing that in certain locations, they would need the non-residential development. They're, they're still gonna need services out here, so some of the properties are gonna be well positioned to provide that as well. So ultimately, we brought this plan amendment to the Board of County Commissioners in August. And um, in addition to those aspects of the proposal, there also were a set of policy changes that addressed timeliness and compatibility. And this was a place where working with the county attorney's office was really critical because these issues are, are sticky and are areas where you want to make sure that you're not going to end up in another legal challenge, more litigation down the line. Um, so we worked very closely with them on what was appropriate to say about the timing of facilities coming online, about the type of planning that needed to be done for infrastructure in this area, on um, how these developments needed to work with the school district on providing school sites, on some timeliness indicators, and they had to be indicators that didn't involve infrastructure. 
which is tricky to come up with. So we looked at things like compatibility and um, enhanced our typical definition for that. Um, we looked at a trip capture measure as an alternative to trying to, again, ensure that we didn't get out of balance in terms of the uses in this area. So to end, we had some, uh, on this section, and then Jay's gonna talk about the resolution in Waimama, but we did have some, some lessons learned. Um, it is really hard to build trust with the community when you're just completely virtual. And so um, that the importance of in-person meetings cannot be underscore, underscored enough. I would also say that I think finding those advocates in the community who can help you um, in BALM, the BALM Community Association, I mean, they took it upon themselves for every week or every other week to sit down and meet with staff um, and, and really dig in and understand that. And Waimama, the, the Waimama Now group and the Waimama Community Development Corporation served that role. And having those partners was really critical um, because they became the ambassadors of these projects and they helped explain it to their neighbors who didn't show up for every meeting, um, which was really helpful. Um, and I think uh, transparency, something that's very important, particularly when you've got a process like this, being very, you know, we put every draft up there on the website. We were very clear about highlighting the changes, summarizing what was different between different drafts, because it wasn't always easy to, to ascertain that. Um, illustrating and testing the concepts was important. I mentioned the market analysis earlier, um, but grounding these concepts in, in, some, in data is important to, um, you know, we had some, some elected officials who thought, well, why can't they do a self-sustaining community with 320 homes? Well, we had to have some data and some backing that wasn't just, well, we, we don't think that works anymore. We had to have something a little bit more than that in terms of depth there. Um, and, and highlighting where there's agreement, that tool of, of where, and building upon that um, was, I think, really important. Um, the last thing I would mention is that I think this whole last year and a half, and in particular the, these projects, has taught me that as much as a planner, I like to have a plan. I like to have a outline of where the project's going, what the milestones are, where, what we're gonna hit when, um, fed into our work program that these were gonna be done at a certain time frame. You know, all of that's out the window. And I've had to learn to adapt myself and my own you know, approach to, to leading the agency to like, okay, what, what do we have to do between now and next week? Like, like that's as far out as I can plan because COVID's gonna change it again. Something else is gonna change it. You're gonna hear something from the community and you have to adapt. And so I think um, for me as a planner, that was a really important lesson that I can't really plan everything. I'll turn it over to you, Jay, to talk about the resolution in Waimama. So I'm going to try to run through this real quick because it is uh, 6 o'clock, and I want to make sure that you guys have time for some questions if you want. Um, well, we were there. Um, one of the first things we did was we actually looked at the existing goals of the community plan. We did not add new goals to it. What we ended up doing was we reprioritized those goals with the community. So, and what that did is during the second go round of public engagement, that slide traveled with us every time that we ended up having a presentation because we were building a slide deck so that folks could see previously what their neighbors had done and build upon that. So that again, when we would have those conversations on, well, you need infrastructure improvements if you're gonna get the economic development you want or you have to have the water and sewer out in the rural service area for the two units to the acre. That was there and we could continuously go back to it. Um, this just goes again with some of that overview of the mobility, the form and character. We'll talk a little bit about that within uh, downtown Waimama where there is an overlay and how that form relates. The form and character relates between the WVR2 and what you have in the uh, urban service boundary by saying that we want to be able to make those connections and we want those connections to be purposeful and safe 
and we want to make sure that as new development comes in, it respects the development that's there. It's being kind to its neighbors. So that's part of what these zonings are trying to do is they're trying to make sure that we can connect things and we can have um, uh, upliftment in that, whether it's in that small town idea of why mama or it's um, a rural enclave that we have in Balm. So again, it just shows you a little bit of uh, the WVR2. WVR2 different than what we had in Balm. WVR2 still clusters, clusters at four units to the acre. You have an open space requirement, 30% contiguous, 10% internal. Uh, both of these end up with one and a half percent set aside for a neighborhood center. One of the other things in Balm, Balm is talking about 160 acres, or you aggregate into something at 160 acres. This is existing, was it 10? acres that you could go to two units to the acre. We dropped it all the way down to five. Um, the aggregation that you might think of, it's not really aggregation because the code is set up with blocks. So you're supposed to develop at 500 foot blocks in that WVR2. So you're just building onto existing communities as you continuously move across. And you're supposed to have an 80% connection with those roads out there. So I'm not supposed to cul-de-sac. In fact, I can't cul-de-sac in WVR2. I can cul-de-sac in Balm. I can't gate a community in WVR2. In Balm, I can gate a community, but it's only internal that I can gate. So a lot of that that we end up with connectivity. Um, again, this just shows a little bit of uh, a typical cross section here, trying to actually address the street and trying to make sure that we can actually have all forms of transportation hierarchy, all forms using that street. Um, we talked a little bit about those community benefits. The community benefits in Waimama, um, the idea of it's the same between Balm and Waimama, but one of the things here is that we had a Basically, the idea in Waimama was that employment would be generated along 674 because Waimama sees itself entirely as a village, whereas up in Baum, they're individual self-contained villages. So here we always had that issue that you're not allowed, you're not pres you're by prescription, you're not allowed to have non-residential uses that are commercial in nature in that WVR2. It's supposed to go along 674. So there was a, a disconnect right there. So there are some non-residential uses that are support, neighborhood support uses like assisted living facilities, childcare and the like that are allowed now in WVR2. But what the community benefits are supposed to be doing is as you build that subdivision, Hopefully, you're providing either employment along 674, you're providing infrastructure that would support employment along 674, you might be providing land along 674, or you're doing something in the same respect with your subdivision, where you're providing land, um, schools, um, parks, uh, as well as activating your neighborhood center you have yourself with something to the effect of live-work units um, or uh, those assisted living facilities. Just an example, again, of off-site um, commercial that might be built along 674. Um, both Waimama and Baum have kind of a catch-all community benefit. This is in respect to, again, that there is a community plan, that secondary planning process that looks at what the folks want in Baum. It's different than what the folks want in Waimama and vice versa. So those goals talk about that issue of what is next for these communities. Transit is something that is wanted in the folks in Waimama. We can't provide transit out there dollar for dollar right now. Our local transit agency is strapped. They would love to provide transit, but they can't right now. That's not to say that we won't be able to in a couple of years in a sales tax referendum or, I don't, I don't know, money falls out of the sky. but. We have to have something on the book that will allow that opportunity for the community, for the developer, for staff, and for your appointed and elected officials all to be able to go, well, what about this? What about that? Uh, after all, none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen six days, six months, six years from now. Um, six different housing types. These housing types are required in those larger lot subdivisions that are being built out there. Again, this is trying to get apartments in there for uh, affordable and workforce housing, townhouse development, different kinds of single family uh, development that you might have out there. 
And then here is a little bit of um, a beta test in this area. And you can see the difference between these two communities. You can see the clustering that you have here and the large amount of open space that is left. Again, 30% contiguous. These are areas that you look for wildlife habitat so that you can have those corridors that exist. There's also a lot of environmental land acquisition program that's out there, ELAP, as we call it. There's a lot. There are thousands and thousands of acres of public land that has been bought uh, that will never be developed and, and it will never be improved. And some of these subdivisions abut that. So having a 30% contiguous allows us that opportunity to have that buffer in there. Um, the, you can see the blocks here, 500 foot blocks. You can also see some of the community benefits that were put in here. There's a school in here. There's an agri-hood that's in here. Again, this is an agricultural community that we're in. There's a trail connection that is in here. Um, there's a variety of uh, park space that's in here. There's a linear park. So all of those community benefits are built in here. And one other community benefit that we could have in this would be that dedication of employment opportunities along 674. Downtown Waimama and the overlay. The overlay does not actually guide the use. The use is primarily guided by the underlying zoning, the Euclidean zoning district. The overlay is interested in the form and function. So we want to do, as I'm sure a lot of you want to do in your small town communities, you want to put your buildings up towards the street, you want to wrap the parking around the back and the rear, and you want it to have um, a pleasing architectural form to it. Uh, same thing with some of the housing. The housing, that overlay only would kick in if you actually uh, bump up your density. We have a transfer of development right, so we have a receiving area in this, sending area being that WVR2, and you can see that main street in there. These districts, as they're basically going, all the way to the west over at, U at 301 uh, Waimama West, basically that's where you've got a Walmart, you've got gas stations, you've got grocery stores in that area. So as you travel east going down that line, you're basically stepping down on your transect, if you will. And once you get to the main street, you're working at one, two story buildings. Here's an idea of what you might have in that overlay. Again, wrapping it around as you saw. And again, we've talked a little bit about some of that key policy, some of the TDRs that we have, the community benefits that we talked of, some of the open space requirements and the housing types. And I think with that, we're done. So we have some. <laughs> so I, I think because this is a law session, it's it's a 1.5 credit. So um, uh, appreciate y'all sticking with us all the way till 6:15. So we, that does give us a couple minutes for questions. If you have any, be happy to answer. Okay. Gosh, I saw hands over here first. <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Johanna? Oh, I would take a look at your comprehensive plan. I've certainly never heard of uh, multiple zonings on a single uh, piece of property. Um, I guess maybe I have. I'm trying to jog my memory to see if that's something that I've encountered, but... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and in, in that um, in that situation, yes, I think I have I have heard and seen properties or single parcels that have multiple future land uses and multiple zoning designations. Um, yeah, I would say I that think, more the norm is that they end up doing a PD, a plan development, yeah. to to blend all of those land use categories together. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. Yes, sure. sir. Um, in the bond situation. Uh huh.
Mm-hmm. And is that what you ended up with? And um, do you know why um, there was such opposition to this, um, to these lots? I mean, you could have you could have said to them, we'll do this. It'll just be a PUD, but there's plenty of open space. You won't have the retention, and you won't spend all this money paving over the earth. So, and I know that's very hard to explain to people. Yeah. Well, we, we certainly showed them a number of different schematics of approaches to lay out the subdivisions, different lot sizes. I mean, I think part of what was also driving the conversation is that, quite frankly, the development community, a lot of their product types are smaller than 70 or 80 foot wide lots. And so they have an interest in having 50, 60 foot wide lots. And so, um, so that, I think, was always to some degree in the community's mind was how, like, we have to, to guard against some of those things. Um, uh, the, I, I'm sure that property values and um, just how that factors into their overall quality of life was um, important to them. Uh, you know, another aspect to this is that these areas, when they develop at two units per acre, they are required to hook into central water and sewer. So there are, other, there are expenses and expectations that some of the infrastructure is going to be more of a, a suburban level. Um, and so that is part of what drove the, the stormwater calculations and things like that. Um, the, the little itty bitty amount of, of open space is what is required so that there is community open space that is usable to the residents. It doesn't mean that there won't be other open space. Probably many of these sites have wetlands on them that are going to have to be preserved. But that's not usable to the community necessarily um, unless they're, they're designed in a certain way. So, so they wanted to make sure that there was something that the residents could use. So yeah. OK, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, there were a couple and there are a couple of zonings in Waimama that were pending, I think, at the time that the moratoriums were enacted and um, they've been moving through the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. We we set a you know specific date by which the moratorium would be applicable. Anything that's in the process already is exempt. So in any moratorium you want to make it very clear what is allowed to go forward and what um, is going to be subject to the moratorium based on the timing. So if I understand you correctly, you didn't, um, the ones that were already in hand, you didn't impose a moratorium? Correct. Correct. They had already been properly submitted to the Development Services Department. No, I'm, I'm just uh, referring to the fact that a developer or applicant came in, paid the fee, submitted an application that was complete. So that that was yeah. that. Sure. I saw another question over here.
Yeah, I, I don't think that we have made compatibility not subjective. I think it absolutely still is. There are more, there are more parameters about what can be considered in terms of compatibility to give some guidance to that discussion. Ultimately, any zoning that, that comes forward under these uh, policies and regulations will be reviewed for consistency with the comprehensive plan with a staff recommendation, and the ultimate determiner will be the BOCC, and we'll see. So all of these have to be they all would require a rezoning to, to activate the additional density. Yeah. And one other aspect for specifically for Baum on the neighborhood compatibility is that currently you must cluster at three and a half units. The clustering being removed, it does give all people involved with the ability to talk about compatibility and not have a crutch of the clustering, which currently right now you have to cluster. So as you were saying, you know, the 80 foot lots and whatnot. Well, if you are next door and again, Primarily, this area is rural at one to five. There are some one acre lots that you'll see there, and then these large subdivisions. So if I do come in with a large subdivision next to one to five, right now, I would end up with a 250 foot buffer next to it currently. That's the adopted that you have. And that would be considered compatible because that is what the code would, would allow for today. Now it allows for the options of that 250 foot buffer or to allow for one acre lots in there. So what, what part of this is, is to give those options so that again, the community can say, but we don't want the buffer and then a bunch of five and 6,000 square foot homes. We would rather see one acre lots up against it and then you go into your five and 6,000 square foot homes on the internal so that we don't see them. The, the other thing also with, with a lot of that buffering is that there's screening involved in it that you had and then with the homes, as it scales up and down, you have a 20% minimum and a 60% maximum on those lots. So you're going to have at least quarter acre lots at 20% of that site in Baum. Today, you can have the entire site by the code at 4,000 square foot lots with a 250 foot buffer around it. So while compatibility is entirely subjective, what we have put forward does air to a better compatibility tool that we have today than what we might have had um, just yesterday. So I see one more hand over here, and then I think our time uh, may already be up, but we'll okay. take one more. All right, sorry about that. That's okay. Two-part question here. So I, I'm from a native Floridian, grew up in a rural lifestyle. Um, I think that the Baum Um, so to answer the second question, I don't know that so far the board has talked about any moratoriums as it relates to water and sewer, but they are having a lot of discussion about um, is there adequate water in particular. Um, there's still water concurrency, and so there is an established process for evaluating that through the development review process, and if there's not adequate service, the, the, you know, the project wouldn't move forward. Um, as it relates, I think most of the public, the, if the larger chunks of land that they're gonna have to set aside are being required to have public access, but I don't know that it's gone so far as to allowing hunting and fishing. 
Yeah, we yeah. haven't really gotten into that detail. So that's a interesting question. But, but there, there is, you know, in South County, um, a tremendous amount of park space that has access to Little Manatee River, Alafia River, and other areas that, mm -hmm. that at least allow for fishing. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you all so much.